Maiduguri, the capital of Borno State, is providing refuge to over a million displaced people. And as the Nigerian army regains control of the main towns and some villages in the state, more and more people continue to arrive. Malnutrition is so rampant in Maiduguri because of the presence of the insurgents Boko Haram. This has stopped people from cultivating crops. They haven't been going to their farms for quite some time. This resulted in shortage of food and subsequently uh, malnutrition kicked in as a result of food scarcity. Health facilities in Maiduguri are overwhelmed, unable to cope with the medical needs of the city's residents as well as the displaced and patients transferred from other towns in Borno such as Bama and Dikwa. We are continuously piling up people who have been discharged but we have got nowhere to take them. We can't take them back to Bama, we can't take them back to Dikwa because the situation there is catastrophic. Recaptured in recent months, some of these towns were held by Boko Haram for two years. Security remains high, but MSF teams are able to travel to them under army escort. For example, to Bama, the second largest town in the state, where the mortality rate exceeds the emergency threshold. 15% of children in Bama are suffering from severe acute malnutrition. Behind me, as you see here, is a graveyard where they buried the mortality cases. Most of the cases died because of hunger and lack of water. And then followed by lack of medicine. Before the NGOs will intervene, no helping hands. Grouped together on the hospital premises, Barma's inhabitants are lacking everything. There's a desperate need for humanitarian aid in places like Bama. Many people's lives are in danger. They need immediate medical assistance in order to survive. For many, it's a matter of days or hours even. There are thousands, or rather tens of thousands of people among the 500 to 800,000 people living in similar conditions on 20 odd sites in Borno State. While aid and emergency medical care is now getting through to some towns in Borno State, other places are still totally inaccessible. Few people we've seen who have managed to get out all talk of huge difficulties to find food and of ongoing insecurity. But we can't actually reach many of these people. We have no idea how many people there are, but we believe they're in very harsh conditions and we hope to be able to access them soon. Some of those who managed to escape the conflict have sought refuge across the border in Cameroon. MSF teams there are treating the wounded, providing mother and child health care and offering mental health support too. Boko Haram militants hit and killed people by cutting their throats. As soon as they arrived, they started killing people, slitting their throats and making women and children watch as they did so. They killed anyone over the age of 15, men and women. MSF is scaling up its activities to help the people of Borno State. Water, food, medical care and shelter for hundreds of thousands of people. The needs are huge. It's the 12th of July, off the Libyan coast. The Bourbon Argos has just been contacted for a rescue operation. So please, just sit very calmly. I will throw life jackets to you. Everybody will get one. 541 people, fleeing persecution and war in their countries, left with no choice other than to rely on people smugglers to get them to Europe. We are here because uh, the European countries haven't, still haven't provided a safe and humane way for people to seek asylum to come to Europe and fleeing their countries that are torn by violence, by conflicts uh, and, uh, and we basically are, are trying to fill a hole, uh, at least temporarily, until uh, Europe wakes up. During the rescue operation, one side of the inflatable dinghy deflated and around 15 people ended up in the sea. They were wearing life jackets and all were rescued.
This incident illustrates the dangers of the Mediterranean that although now a graveyard on Europe's doorstep is the only hope left for thousands of people. Aya has already lived through at least one Israeli offensive and she has only ever known Gaza under blockade. Five months ago she suffered second and third degree burns. It was 7 o'clock in the morning, we'd made tea for breakfast. We were sitting on the balcony and she dropped the teapot, spilling boiling water all over her body and face. Aya is better now, but here in this stricken land, domestic accidents are only too common, and victims join the long list of people wounded during the 2014 conflict and who still require treatment. Occupation and the embargo are the main causes of the challenges we face to provide medical services. They create a lack of drug and medical supplies and constant power cuts. And people also start messing around with electricity cables and alternative energy sources, which results in an increase in the number of burns victims that we then need to treat. In Gaza, MSF runs three post-operative care clinics and regularly deploys surgeons for reconstructive surgery programs for the victims of war and the embargo. Hepatitis C is a chronic disease affecting, among others, injecting drug users and people living with HIV. Transmitted through the blood, slowly but surely it attacks the liver and causes fibrosis, a scarring of the organ that prevents it from functioning properly. Severely affected patients develop cirrhosis of the liver and frequently require a transplant. A few years ago, the only available treatment had to be taken for one whole year cost 25,000 euros and caused numerous side effects. And even then, only half of patients recovered. Now, a far more positive alternative exists, a new class of drugs called direct-acting antivirals. One of them, sofosbuvir, has almost no side effects, reduces the risk of relapse significantly and needs to be taken for just 12 weeks, with a cure rate of 95%. Its price is the only snag. It costs around 100 euros to manufacture a course of sofosbuvir treatment. Yet in the US, it costs almost $100,000 to treat one patient. Simply put, the price of a gram of sofosbuvir costs 67 times more than a gram of gold. In France, treating everyone suffering from the disease would exceed the budget required to fund all of Paris's hospitals. The price of the drug depends on the agreement reached with Gilead, the pharmaceutical company that produces it. In 91 countries, sofosbuvir is supposed to be available in its generic form, but these countries only account for half of the people with the disease. Most of the worst affected countries do not have the benefit of a licensing agreement between Gilead and generic manufacturers, which would give them access to the drug at a cheaper price. In countries where Gilead has reached an agreement, pretexting the fight against the resale of drugs, it imposes draconian measures. The company has, for example, access to personal information, including the name and address of each patient, which it can use as it sees fit. Yet another consequence of the pharmaceutical company's pricing policy is that the drug is subject to rationing. In France, instead of providing treatment to all those who need it, it is prescribed only to those with advanced liver fibrosis. But treating all patients would eradicate the reservoir of the disease, which would mean no more patients, no more virus, and no more contagion. If it were accessible to all those who need it, sofosbuvir could potentially eradicate the disease.
I traveled for seven hours from, the, uh, from Peshawar, uh, one of the big cities in northwest Pakistan. So you have to go through 39 checkpoints. And in my mind, I was thinking about what it must be like to be a patient who's sick or a woman who, who's, who needs to give birth and what it must be like to go through all those checkpoints. And this is during a time of relative peace. Um, sadly, uh, peace is shattered very quickly in Pakistan. Uh, sadly, extremism is a part of daily life. People are facing this every day. But th when I was in Fata in the tribal areas, this was a relatively peaceful time. But yet, there was all these checkpoints, all this security. Uh, and it really does disrupt people's lives. I mean, having to, when you hear a che the word checkpoint, perhaps it doesn't really mean anything unless you actually have to negotiate your way through one. And it's more than about restricting movement. It actually um, makes people feel like they're not safe. And it kind of sometimes also makes them not want to travel through a checkpoint. So they actually think over and over again before they take that journey because they know that there's a lot of danger that they're likely to face.